So this afternoon, I wanted to kind of try and pull together some of the themes of the retreat, which was really about transforming suffering into joy, but also how that relates to embracing the suffering of everyday life and using that suffering that we experience in our day-to-day interactions and lives and you know, bodies when they're tired and stressed out, uh, how we can bring up some joy and make some meaning of all of this. So um, there is this gap between retreat time and everyday life that's sometimes not really um, explained very well. Perhaps we, we get a bit lost in that place because you can be in a really quiet context with people around that are causing very little disturbance for you. Even if you think they are, wait till you go home to your families <laughs> or wherever you're going, you know, standing in a queue for the bus or the train. So... Um, yeah, we need to know how to make that transition a little bit smooth and, and how we can practice when we're not in the seated posture. And as I suggested yesterday, part of that is learning to use our attention skillfully and wisely and not only focusing on the things that are difficult, but also seeing another side to things. And of course, seeing how we can um, respond to that suffering skillfully. So instead of reacting and trying to push it away or uh, perhaps wallowing in it and uh, forgetting that, you know, perhaps our response is influenced by our current mood and it isn't as heavy as it seems, you know, the burden will feel better after a good night's sleep. So instead we learn to um, relate to it skillfully with an attitude of opening our hearts to the suffering of life. And... uh, Instead of talking more about the theory, I wanted to talk about a couple of really inspiring examples of people who've clearly been through a lot, probably a lot more than we ever have, and hopefully you'll ever have to go through, and what they have to say about this. And the first person is actually the Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh, who passed away about a year ago. No, yeah, actually, about a year ago, isn't it? I think I was with one of his um, disciples at the time. Uh, or soon after his passing. And uh, I know it was an enormous loss, but also an inspiration for people who were close to him to bring his teachings forward, to carry on, you know, integrating and applying and spreading those teachings. And uh, the amazing thing about Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh is that he was actually a refugee, a Vietnamese refugee and a peace activist. So he went through the most incredible suffering, seeing the massacre of his people, you know, even having, I think, one of his own monasteries kind of decimated at one time. They developed this place in the beautiful mountains. There were monks and nuns practicing. And they had to basically leave and start from scratch, sometimes with very little food, no resources at all. And one of his ways of um, responding to this was to understand the importance of loving community and to try to develop that community wherever he went. But I read a little thing about um, him and one of the quotes he he said about suffering in his life, which might be surprising um, because sometimes we imagine that people who've been through that just want to, never want to have to face it again. But he was actually expressing a kind of gratitude to the suffering that has helped him develop himself so far on the path. So he said, each of us need suffering to grow up to become compassionate, wise, and happy. Happiness can only be recognized against the background of suffering. If we hadn't suffered from war or feeling unsafe, we wouldn't know the importance and the beauty of peace. He's talking about himself here, I think. So he's saying, if I hadn't been hungry, I wouldn't know the happiness of having something to eat. And that's real hunger, not just, oh, I'm a bit peckish right now. And then the bit that really struck me, because I guess he didn't have his own kids, but he obviously had lots of disciples. He said, I wouldn't want to send my children to a place where there's no suffering because they wouldn't have the opportunity to learn compassion. Isn't that amazing? Because obviously we don't want our children to suffer. I mean, for any mothers in this room or anyone who cares for another, you know, sometimes we want to take that suffering away, but are we too premature with that? You know, because we can't protect people from suffering their whole life. And, you know, when we do have parents who kind of overprotect us, just as the Buddha's parents did, there tends to be a reaction and a rebellion against that at some point, because it just doesn't feel true to life. So I found that really beautiful. And, um, 
you know, in a way it reminded me of the Deva realms because the Deva realms, the so-called celestial realms, may be equivalent to the Christian idea of heaven, um, are said to be places where beings go who've been very pure-hearted, very generous, very giving in this life, and they go to these realms that are full of happiness. You know, the kind of happiness that you might start to experience in meditation, the happiness of peace, the happiness that's not of the sensual kind. But one of the reasons that... Uh, those devas find it difficult to get enlightened. It's very, uh, it's very difficult. Is because they don't have enough suffering, and in a sense, that means they can't really appreciate the happiness that they have. If it's always the same, if it's constant, then it becomes the norm. And there's been all kinds of studies done on people. For example, people who've lost limbs, and for about six months, they really struggle to find meaning again in their life and to cope with the trauma and the loss. There's a kind of grieving process that, that goes on. But after a while, they come up to the same level of happiness that they had before. So we normalize whatever it is that we experience, and we can even make meaning from that. Even one of my friend's sisters, who's not Buddhist at all, but uh, it's a nice story because uh, she went through a terrible loss. She lost her sister to suicide. I think her, her sister had um, symptoms of schizophrenia, and at one point... She attacked her grandma and uh, was put in prison for that when she was having, you know, a schizophrenic episode. And uh, in prison, she actually ended up committing suicide, which was totally tragic. And her sister was beside herself with grief. But now she's developed uh, her own kind of charity, which works with um, people outdoors and particularly people with mental health. And she's developed all these beautiful programs, you know, to get them into nature and to, to kind of include counselling, but also that kind of... I think there's something nowadays called eco-counselling, isn't there? Someone came to visit me in Oxford who was studying that, and it's very beautiful to get them back in touch with nature and that sense of belonging that we all so desperately need, you know, the sense that we don't have to be perfect to be loved. We might have mental health illnesses, mental illnesses, <laughs> it's difficult to call them disorders because it's natural that the mind sometimes gets sick, right? The brain, it's the brain and not the mind. Um, so we need to really remove the stigma around that. And uh, yeah, it's far more difficult when we're in denial. We don't want to accept that we might need medication from time to time. It's not a personal failing at all. So she has transformed her life into something really meaningful and as a result of her sister's death, which, should never, you know, which she would have never wished for and I'm sure she'd do anything to bring her back, yet she's helping so many people that may not otherwise have been helped. And I think it's very different when someone helps you who understands what you're going through or who has personally experienced the results of, of something like a mental illness you know, in her family. It's very, very different. There's a different way of um, being informed as to how to support. And uh, another example of that is from the Buddha's time. It was uh, one of the enlightened nuns, but she wasn't always enlightened. She was um, quite a well-to-do young woman growing up in India. And uh, I think her parents kept her quite protected. So she had maidens and servants and you know, all these attendants and cooks and the works, as I think still happens in sort of wealthy parts of India and, and Asia, probably also in the UK. And, uh, and so they obviously wanted to get her married to somebody of a similar standing, class-wise or caste-wise, which is still very common in India today. And um, unfortunately, she was a bit rebellious and she... Uh, ended up absconding with a uh, one of the male servants and they ran off to uh, start a life together. And unfortunately, um, I think she'd had a child already and she was pregnant with a second child. And uh, the first time that she'd given birth, she couldn't make it to her parents' home. So she gave birth kind of on the road. And this time, with the second pregnancy, she said to her husband, I want to get to my parents' home please find some, you know, shelter for us on the road. So he went out to um, collect straw and twigs and whatever they needed, grass, to make a little temporary shelter halfway. But unfortunately, he just never came back. And later, she continued her journey and found him dead there from a snake bite on the road. So understandably, she went a little bit mad with grief but continued on anyway because, you know, she was soon to give birth and needed to get home even more. 
But then on the way, uh, there was this huge river that she had to cross and she didn't know how to do it, carrying the small child and then, uh, you know, with the... I think she'd given birth by now to the little one, so she had a tiny baby as well. And she had to cross this huge river. So what she did was um, took the first child across, the toddler, whilst leaving... Uh, or was it the other way around? I think she took the baby across first and left the baby on the far side of the river and the toddler was waiting on the other. And then when she um, was on the far side, she started going back to get the toddler. And uh, the toddler started kind of waving and she thought, what's happening? And then she realised that a, a big vulture had come to get the baby and taken it away. So she started uh, going back to the toddler and she, she was waving, that's right, to get the vulture out of the way, to try and shoo the vulture off. And the toddler thought she was asking him or her to come across the river. So the toddler started to wade through the river and drowned as well. So by now she's lost both children and a husband. And then on the horizon she saw that there'd been a big storm and that her parents' house had gone up in smoke. And basically she lost the whole family in a day. And she went completely mad with grief. You know, as you can probably imagine, what would you know? You wouldn't, you'd be completely lost. You know, everything that was dear to you was completely gone. And um, the story goes that she was wandering around the, the next city she came to. I think it was Savati, where the Buddha happened to be. Completely naked, completely out of her mind. And... Um, and some people started to see her. I think she approached where the Buddha lived and they um, threw a cloth over her and said, you know, wear this cloth, sister, um, come. And the Buddha said, come, my child, sit down. And he gave her a teaching and he treated her with respect. And as a result of that, she actually practiced. And one day she was washing her feet and saw this water coming down the hill and she just noticed at that moment the impermanence of the water, you know, that whenever a stream flows, it's never the same water. The water that just came has now disappeared and the next one is new water particles. And then she went back to her um, little hut and sat down on the bed, put out the lamp. In those days there were little oil lamps. And as soon as the lamp went out, so she experienced full liberation. So all the defilements, all the suffering went out as well at that time. Which is wonderful. Um, which is almost remarkable, almost unbelievable. But it didn't end there because what um, happened next was that she went on to become a great teacher. And there were stories throughout the suttas that talk about... Um, all these nuns that were kind of practicing on their own for years and maybe going to different teachers but never really getting very far. So does that sound familiar to anyone with their practice? You know, we struggle, we sometimes make progress, then we kind of, you know, fall aside for a while. So this was happening to them as well. But then when they'd meet Patachara, her name was, which literally meant rag robe wearer, the one that has the cloth, that's been given the cloth, uh, because the Buddha gave her the robe to cover her body. Uh, when they met her, suddenly they all started getting really fast results. And she had apparently up to 500 people who were fully enlightened under her, so female disciples, many of whom had lost children, lost family members themselves. And I think, you know, again, perhaps something to do with her power as a teacher was the fact she'd suffered so much. And especially in the sense that she could help those who'd been through similar because when you know that somebody understands and when you can see that that person has transformed the suffering into joy, into freedom, into a greater perspective on life, it's incredibly inspiring and gives us hope. It gives us so much more hope than any theory could. And I actually have a very beautifully carved wooden statue of Patachara at our monastery. We should have an opening day just for you to meet this statue because it doesn't feel like a statue, it feels like Patachara. It's just one of the most incredibly serene and beautiful, peaceful faces, demeanors in the form of a statue that I've ever seen. It's just beautiful. And there's a sense of absolute peace, absolute equanimity. And made all, all the more potent and powerful by what she'd been through, you know, where she'd come from, if you like, the lowest place you could possibly be. So these are some examples that may seem distant, but um, one more example I'd like to share is uh, 
from a nun called Ajahn Vyama, and she was one of the first, uh, she was the first nun to go to Perth. She was Australian. Uh, she passed away a couple of years ago now with cerebral degeneration. In fact, it was mm, whole body muscular atrophy, but it affected her um, brain and all her functions basically by the end, so she couldn't speak or eat for herself. And uh, I learned a lot about her through her closest disciple, Ayaseri, who's become a very good friend and respected older sister for me. Uh, she's Malaysian. And she basically left the monastery with her teacher, with Ajahn Vyama, when she started to get sick and spent the last 11 years of Ajahn Vyama's life looking after her one-to-one -one, um, as a nun, sacrificing her retreat time, sacrificing any freedom in the usual sense of the word, just to tend to her teacher as she went through this sickness, chronic disease. And um, she was just writing a story up on Facebook recently. There's a whole sort of series of them, little tiny stories, but with a really beautiful point. And in this story, she was saying, Ajahn Vyama, the nun who was uh, the senior most bhikkhuni in Perth, um, was always so compassionate and caring to all the support workers. Even though she could barely speak, she'd always inquire um, as to how their children were and how, you know, their friends were. And she got to know all of them so well. And she'd really start to take joy in the tiny things in life. For example, if she, uh, if somebody brought a dog to the monastery, she'd, you know, be so tender and her face would light up with this little fluffy dog. Or if somebody took her to pay respects to the Buddha statue, her face again would just light up and she'd sort of hold the statue high on her head and, uh, and, and just have this amazing sense of peace. And uh, apparently, even in the last week of her life, uh, the physiotherapists were asking her, like, how do you feel on the scale of one to ten? And she said, oh, about a six. This is like in the last week of somebody's life who basically has barely any functions left. I went to visit her in about 2015. She only passed away two years ago. So this is well before the end of her life. And at that time, you had to book an appointment and you had to wait for, uh, well, it usually took several weeks before you could get to see her because Ayaseri, her other non-attendant, would have to um, get her up or out of the bed into a special chair and then into this kind of very complicated sort of chair, wheelchair type thing. And it would really involve a lot to lift her and to move her. And she wouldn't be able to stay in that position for long. So you had to be dead on time, you know. And even then, she could barely speak. It was just a little bit of grunting that didn't sound like words. But Ayaseri could understand everything. Um, it was like she could just translate whatever she was trying to convey. And uh, my respect went through the roof, really, for both of them. And uh, sometimes I say to her, I say, you know, it's so inspiring that you sacrifice so much. And she said, it wasn't a sacrifice. Yeah, it, it served me too. I was able to be with my teacher for 12 years at her side. And, and now she's got her own little place in Perth, just a little hermitage, a bit like the one I have in Oxford. But she lives alone. She has um, people coming to offer food every day. And she is so contented and happy just to have a place, you know. And it's just a normal, very simple life. I mean, quite a busy life at times, serving her community, the people that looked after them all those years. But um, just that gratitude for little, you know, and that contentment with simplicity is incredibly inspiring, considering, you know, how much sacrifice I think she did make. So some inspiring examples for you, but even uh, otherwise, in our lives, I would like to talk a bit about how we um, cultivate positive states of mind faced with, for example, difficult people and people that cause uh, maybe uh, distress or anger or resentment to arise. Because one of the biggest uh, blockages to our happiness and freedom is resentment. It's kind of when the anger gets dug in but not transformed. It just becomes kind of pushed down and becomes almost like concealed under a layer of concrete or something. And it's kind of bubbling away, you know. And one person triggers you and bah, a big explosion. You know, this is what happens with resentment, doesn't it? You know, when we push our emotions under, underground. Um, and in the Buddhist text, there are many ways to work with this. And uh, one simile that's really beautiful is... Uh, I mentioned, didn't I, about one of the chief disciples of the Buddha who wore rag robes 
so they use that simile. They use the simile of finding a piece of really dirty, filthy cloth on the street and uh, you want to make use of it. And so instead of just throwing it away, what you do is you notice where there's a clean part of the cloth. And it says in this uh, sutta that you put your foot on the dirty part and then you pull off the clean part with the other foot and you make use of that. So you take that piece home, you wash it and dye it and basically stitch it together with other bits of cloth to make a robe. So in this way, something that is actually partially defiled, if you like, or partially mucky, dirty, useless, always has its other side. And in the same way, we can learn to look at people that way. So the examples given there are if somebody's speech is unwholesome, but their actions are wholesome, we simply, um, let's say, give attention and um, encourage the actions that are good. So we don't always have to criticize the negative or focus or fixate on that. We can look at the other side of the person and actually encourage that. It's like feeding it. Actually, Thich Nhat Hanh, again, has a beautiful simile of watering the flowers and not the weeds. So it's like, yeah, sure, we can spend some time taking out these uh, less um, wholesome reactions through mindfulness, through meeting them with compassion, etc., uh, by being fully present and with understanding and empathy towards them. But also we can cu cultivate the positives. And another um, simile that he gives is that uh, it's like, well, it could be the opposite. Somebody could have, you know, very, um, Im uh, what would it be, the opposite? bad actions, but their speech is good, which I find harder, actually, because sometimes people can be very smooth talking, can't they? <laughs> but they're kind of deceiving you, or uh, I don't know, maybe they're speaking as though they know a lot, but actually they don't live up to what they preach, which is probably most of us, especially teaching the Dhamma, because we're trying to teach very lofty things, and usually I don't think you'll find many fully enlightened teachers in this world, you know, <laughs> we're yet to uh, realise the highest goal. But still, there can be a lot of good in a person's speech. Maybe it's very beneficial to many. And uh, we can engage in, uh, with that part of the person. So the Buddha, again, gave a simile about um, water that's covered with algae. And you want to drink. So in this case, it's like you have resentment, but you want to quench it. You want to become cool. You want to refresh your mind. So you just push away the algae, you push it to the side, and then you cup your hands and drink. However... There are people <laughs> whose action and speech is really rotten and we really object. And uh, what do we do with such people? So the Buddha said in this case, we develop compassion. He said it's just like a sick person, you know, wandering across a desert or a, a barren place who doesn't have, who's very ill, but doesn't have a doctor, doesn't have an attendant and doesn't have any medicine. So I like this simile because you can think of the Buddha as the doctor. You can think of the Sangha as the attendants, you know, the wise companions on the path. And of course, the medicine is the Dhamma. But this person doesn't have any of that. And yet they're so, so sick. So the Buddha says, in this case, we have to arouse sheer compassion and tender concern because this person is headed for calamity and disaster. And we can see that, can't we, in the world, you know, the kind of people who are, I feel really sorry, actually, for the people in the military in Myanmar. I mentioned that country earlier on today. But for those who don't know, there's an absolute genocide going on. And the people in the military are basically don't have a lot of choice, you know. Either they've been kind of um, part of that for so many generations that that's become the norm and they've never questioned whether it's wrong to kill or they're kind of recruited from very poor villages, young people who have no other income. And basically, if they don't join, they, they may get shot or killed. You know, They don't have a choice. And the kind of devastation they're causing, you know, the sheer violence and, and decimation, even in monasteries, they're going to monasteries and killing monks and nuns. You know. Um, they're just saying, where's the Democrats, and going there and kind of anyone who's suspected of having a different view just gets mutilated. It's pretty extreme. And you just think, gosh, if they knew the karma they were making, you know, and the suffering that they would experience later, because at some point, if not in this life, at the time of death, you're going to think, oh, God, what have I done, you know? Maybe not, oh, God, oh, gosh. <laughs> oh, crikey. 
darn. <laughs> that wasn't very skillful. And uh, one of my friends who lived in Burma for about 15 years, speaks fluent Burmese and taught English there. He's got this whole organization called Insight Myanmar, which used to be all about Dhamma talks, but now it's turned entirely to activism and to spreading the word and bringing uh, aid into that place directly through local people he can trust. And uh, he had an interview with somebody who, um, what do you call it, when somebody de defer deters, deferred, defers from the army, they um, defect from the army. And uh, in this interview they said, I didn't know it was wrong to kill. I didn't know. And now they know and they feel terrible about that. So if we really understand something about the law of karma or something about the suffering one must be going through to do unwholesome things or after doing unwholesome things, we would have a lot of compassion and we would do our best to stop those actions wherever we possibly can. And then also, lastly, um, another response, a couple more actually, that he, he talks about in this particular sutta, and I forget the exact reference, I think it's Anguttara Sixes somewhere in there, is um, that sometimes equanimity is the most wholesome and positive response. Because sometimes we can't help another person, we can't point out where we think they're going wrong. Just as we can't see it for ourselves, or we don't want it pointed out to us, you know, it's very hard, isn't it, sometimes to receive that feedback. So um, sometimes equanimity is the best way we can respond. And in a sense, it's a form of patience, a form of trust in a way, like waiting until conditions change so that either you can help that person or that that person's behavior changes. Sometimes, you know, we have to uh, take distance from people for a while. And the Buddha said, that's okay, you can ignore a person that's causing you a lot of trouble. Um, even in, in the monastic sangha, um, it's recommended not to train someone who can't receive feedback. So if a person, you know, you give them feedback politely, maybe firmly, but politely, and they respond by counter-reproving the reprover. I love that, <laughs> counter-reproving the reprover, you know. Well, you're like this, and you're like that, and you did this and this. Or if they respond with anger, or if they respond by de deferring the conversation elsewhere, then it's very hard to train them. And he says, don't even try, because that would be troublesome and full of suffering for you. So he's always compassionate to us ourselves as well as to the other. As we said in the beginning of the retreat, we try to uh, live lives that are beneficial to ourselves and others. If we can't do that, the next best thing is to live lives that are beneficial to ourselves. And the most unskillful is to live lives that are only benefiting others but not ourselves. Because, I mean, even at the basic level, you can see that that would drain you, right? If not be outright destructive over time. And also, how would you really know where that person's benefit lies if you don't know how to take care of yourself? Right? Maybe we're not as good at taking care of ourselves, but at least we have to have that kind of MOT every so often, right? We have to wash and refresh our minds, you know, with the daily practice, morning and night. If you don't think you have time for the daily practice, or any daily practice, just five minutes when you wake up before you get out of bed, metta, some phrases of metta, some intentions of how you wish to proceed through the day, you know, or maybe remind yourself of... Um, the likely hindrances that might arise, especially if you know you're going into a situation that normally elicits a certain response, you can tell yourself, in this situation, there's a chance I'll get impatient. I'll determine, or I'll make the intention just to hold my tongue or <laughs> just to take a breath. Hmm? And you make that intention clear to yourself before you enter that situation in the day. You can also practice loving kindness towards whoever you might meet that day. Even if you don't know who they may be, you can spread it to all those unknown beings so that you have a positive disposition when you do come in contact with other beings. Reminding yourself, you know, of our common humanity that we all suffer, yet we all wish for happiness, desire our own happiness too. Sometimes we just don't know how that comes about. And also the importance of wise friendship which is really, really key to developing on this path. I just got an application form for someone else who wants to come and stay at the monastery, which is wonderful. And they said the reason they wanted to come is because they need to be around practitioners. They need to be around people who are devoting their lives to practice. And they said the best way they can refer to those people is as kin. I thought that was so lovely. 
And this person has a happy marriage, kids, career, everything. But they want to be with kin. That means people on the path, people who understand that person's most deeply held values and that person's deepest wish for freedom and support to practice the path. So the Buddha again said that the um, essence or the most important thing in the holy life is wise friendship. That's the most key thing to our success. It's the whole of the spiritual path. And he said, because you can be expected to practice the Eightfold Path if you have wise friends. And I've noticed in my practice life, of course, I can practice anyway, so I think, right? But what about if you're going off the path? I mean, who's going to let you know? Who can you go to to check? It's so important, isn't it? If we start to get into a negative mood or start to kind of get overwhelmed by something. I actually managed to get in touch with Ajahn Brown just now, so that was really nice because I was feeling a bit overwhelmed by the project ahead of me and all the work and maintenance and renovation that has to be done on this property. Now we've got the survey results, 95 pages long, ah, and lots and lots of things to kind of polish up. And also the estate agent's telling us that if we try to renegotiate the price, basically they'll pass the property to someone else who's disappointed not to, not to have the chance. So, you know, basically we're being sort of threatened not to do that. Um, so, yes, we'll have quite some maintenance work. And uh, he reminded me of this, uh, well, first of all, his voice is so calming and kind. So that already puts me, sorry, that's not a calming, kind voice, that's creepy. <laughs> But anyway, in this case, it was natural. So it was very calming and very kind and very practical. But he reminded me of this simile of the hand. When your hand is here, <laughs> you can't see anything else. This means you've lost your perspective. This is all you can see, you know, right now. But if you hold your hand here, you can see your hand, but you can see the whole room as well. You can see everything else. Okay, there's some maintenance. Hmm. There's also a website and a... <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, that isn't what you meant. There's also space around it. <laughs> so, and lovely people here in this room, you know. And space in the room, you know. Even in the crowded street, there's space. So we can change our perspective from time to time and stop ourselves getting sucked in. But that's really the essence of uh, any spiritual path. We need these wise friends. We need our teachers who we can go to and say, I'm right now I'm feeling small. I don't always feel like the big teacher helping everyone else. You know, sometimes I want support. And it's so important we can have that. Because there are a few kind of dead ends on this path. There are a few kind of pitfalls. You know, we discussed some of those. One of them is this kind of grandiose grandiose sense of self, spiritual ego, so-called, or spiritual bypass when it's extreme. Um, dead ends, like kind of getting into some sort of peaceful but drowsy state and just stopping there. You're not really bright. You're not really uh, using the meditation for the right reason. It can also be a kind of dulling out. And sometimes even the slightest kind of deviation from the path, it's like you start, here's the path, and you're on the path for a bit, then you go slightly to the side, but you end up going like this. And the further you go, the further you get from the goal, the two ends end up somewhere totally different. Or it can just end part way. And I think this is the most common experience, that people have some sort of initial stage of brightness in the mind or a sense of bliss and they're like that's it that must be enlightenment you know there's many books been written all about people's instant enlightenment and to me they're just stages of temporary fluking a bit of samadhi um, kind of by chance and yeah sure it has a powerful effect because if it's really samadhi it will but um, it's not the full picture and this is not to bring anyone down but it's to say there's more you know don't stop there because you're stopping short of the full benefit. So we keep going on the path and uh, we can start from any place. You know, we start from where we are. We can always uh, develop more generosity, more virtue. We can rejoice in the goodness of our lives. We can practice metta. We can um, serve in the Dhamma, in the community and other charities that mean a lot to you. You can still join Sheffield Insight as well. I hear that there were some people interested yesterday, so that's really great because when you've been involved in uh, organising a retreat, it's just so heartwarming when you see people turn up and sit on their seat. You're like, oh, I had contact with this person, I was wondering who they were and here they are and they've come so far to be here, you know, and it's really sweet, it's really very sweet. And you take a big part of the benefit they gained, you have that satisfaction in your mind, in your heart. So that's really beautiful. And lastly to say... 
that just as this um, beautiful sutta says, our qualities, our happiness, our spiritual um, maturity fills up drop by drop. It's a process that's conditioned by natural causes. It's nothing to do with us. All we have to do is trust that the causes we put in place will have beautiful effects. All we have to do is keep on putting those drops of water in the jar or those drops of water, allowing the rain to come down the mountain into the streams which fill up the ponds and fill up the pools and the lakes and the rivers and flow to the sea. And in this simile, the sea is really Nibbana. It's not any kind of unconditioned, it's not any kind of uh, state of mind, but it's something altogether beyond this world of samsara, which inevitably involves happiness and suffering. This is just our human condition. But there is a way beyond all of this. And the way beyond is through, right? The way beyond is through. So this is enough for me. And uh, we'll do some meditation now. So I've spoken a lot and given a lot of guided meditation and we're having a fully guided metta meditation at the end. So I think it would be nice to just sit quietly for half an hour. Yeah. So I'll just sit quietly together and you can practice whatever meditation feels right for you right now. So check with your mind first of all, whether it's restless or quiet or happy or a little bit brittle perhaps and see what would be a skillful way to practice. Maybe just letting things be. Enjoying the atmosphere, the spiritual friendship and always starting with just landing gently like a feather lands on pine needles on the ground, landing gently in your body and mind. So I'll be quiet and let you practice for half an hour and I'll ring the bell to end.
I'm going to ring the gong for those who wish to have some walking meditation, but if uh, you're getting peaceful and enjoying sitting, you can just continue. Otherwise, we'll have some walking, and I guess we'll ring the bell at 10 past 3 so that we can all be back in here. So it gives you a five-minute break before the Q&A, whether you want to stay here or do some walking. <laughs> 